You're listening to the audio version of a message from Annistown Row Church. If you would, take your Bibles or, uh, of course, anything in which you have a Bible app on, And if you would, hold it up high and repeat after me. This is my Bible. Bible. The Word of God. God. And inside, inside, God tells me me the plans He has for my life. He He tells me how much He loves me. me me. Even when this world world tells me that I'm not lovable. And I shall be. All that God desires for me to be. Because his Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. This I proclaim in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn your attention to Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to have our focal point on verses 28 through 34, Matthew chapter 8, focal point on verses 28 through 34. Uh, We will, uh, or I will read to you in a moment the uh, correlative passages that go with it, but Matthew 8 verses 28 through 34. As I prepare to read. I'm going to read in just a moment portions, pieces from correlative passages that will come from Mark and Luke. In other words, this particular um, event is recorded in three, two other gospels. Uh, It's so in just a moment, but Matthew 8, verse 28 through 34. It says, and when he came to the other side, into the country of the Gadarenes. Two demon-possessed men confronted him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. And they cried out saying, what business do you have with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many pigs feeding at a distance from them. And the demons begged him saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. And they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. And the herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. And today we're just going to talk about when pigs fly. That's what we're going to talk about, when pigs fly. I I, I want you to know first and foremost um, that this series that we're going through, The Devil in the Details, I really need you to take it very seriously. I've shared with you before that as a church, I think we have to be strongly anchored in biblical solid doctrines, having a solid foundation because in my lifetime, and you may have discovered this also, that many Christians suffer simply because we lack solid foundation. Sometimes there's such a focus for the audience or for the preacher to scratch an itch, to satisfy uh, a, a subject matter or to get sound bites or to feel good. And if you're not careful, a church can become filled with people who are biblically ignorant. 
And because one is biblically ignorant, they're not going to be able to actually live out in the world as if they have a biblical view. Why? Because they have not been taught a proper biblical view. So therefore, they make decisions in such a worldly way because they've only been taught to feel good and to pursue feeling good. I'm going to share with you up front, there's going to be many things shared uh, whether it's in a life group setting or this setting, it's not going to feel good to you. It's not going to sound good to you. In fact, you may even say, why are we talking about this? Because it impacts all of our lives, each and every last one of us. These are serious matters, so seriously that God presented them in his word. And so I may not have a, uh, I may not be able to entertain you ever with a, a hoop or a strong holler across the stage, but pray that here there's always solid teaching and teachers, we got some great teachers here. And so where we are today, take it seriously um, as you know, cause this stuff is impacting all of us and uh, the devil wants you to not take it seriously. So here, the main objective we're gonna, main outcome we're gonna see is that Christ has victory over demons. What I need you to know up front is that demons are real. Last week, we talked specifically about Satan and his various names, his position, uh, his uh, eviction from heaven. We talked about some of his purpose, uh, some of his purposes, or his purpose, um, and I told you before that he does not operate alone. He leads others. And they're called demons. And I want to share with you a little bit about the origin and the reality and the purpose of demons. In Matthew chapter 28, verses uh, all, all the way through 29, we get to see a little bit about this. Um, here's the thing. Angels are often seen and accepted as being benevolent beings, caring, compassionate, uh, giving, while demons are seen as malevolent beings, wicked, and vile, evil. And those are correct. But I, I want you to narrow in right now with me specifically uh, on this particular text and how these demons operate. So in the first two verses, what you start to see is Jesus is walking through this area, the Gadarenes, and this is, a, this is east, of, uh, east of the Sea of Galilee. And... Jesus is coming through this area and the text speaks of these two men that are demon possessed. And some may ask, well, why is Jesus even going into that area? Because that area is a Gentile area. It's because Jesus has an appointed meeting. Everything and everywhere Jesus went was on God's agenda for Jesus. Jesus never did or went anywhere that was outside of God's agenda. When he met the woman at the well, that was on God's agenda. It wasn't about uh, a, ge a geographical necessity. It was about a ministry necessity. This is a ministry necessity for Jesus. And the outcome will be that God the Father will receive the glory. And Jesus was all about God the Father receiving the glory. And so Jesus is in this Gentile area known for its wickedness, uh, its being vile and unclean. And, and once again, it's an appointed place for Jesus to be. While he's there, he's confronted with these two men. You can read this same account in the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to share just a portion of that from you in Mark chapter Five, and you'll notice it says something a little bit unique. It says they came to the other, 
Mark chapter 5, verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him and he had his dwelling amongst the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with the chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains. He was gashing himself with stones. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and he bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion. For we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The demons implored him saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave them permission. And coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep, steep bank into the sea about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and the country, and the people came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus, and they observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed, and in his right mind, and very, uh, and very uh, man who had, the le who had had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. As he was getting into the boat, it says the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, go home to your people, report to them what great things the Lord had done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and he began to proclaim and de de decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. I want to read to you this other portion because I want you to put the story together because I want you to walk away from here today saying, you know what? I always thought of this like it was some type of movie, like it was, uh, like I was looking at a fairy tale of the hobbits. Listen, this is real stuff here. So if you don't mind, in Luke chapter 8, verse 27, it's in the same place, it's opposite of Galilee, to the east of Galilee, and when he came out onto the road, he was met by a man from the city who was possessed with demons and who had not put on any clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but in the tombs. Seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell before him and said in a loud voice, what business do we have with each other? Jesus, son of the most high God, I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had seized him many times. And he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he will break his bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him to uh, him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. And he gave them permission and the demons came out of the man and entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the city and out in the country. The people went out to see what had happened and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they became frightened. Those who had seen it reported it to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been made well. And all the people of the country, of the Gerasenes and the surrounding district, asked him to leave them, for they were gripped with great fear. 
and he got into a boat and he returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But he sent him away saying, return to your house and describe what great things God has done for you. And so he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. I wanted to read these three accounts to you because uh, of, of the details. Details matter here. And in Luke and Mark, you will notice it mentions the one man and not the two man. Here's the reason why. You have various accounts. It's as if I went uh, somewhere to, the, to, to Walmart and I said, I was talking to the cashier at Walmart and she told me this. Well, if I come back and tell you this, there are certain things you can ascertain based upon the information that I just gave you. One, that I was speaking to a female because I used the word she. Another thing you can ascertain from it is the fact that that person is an employee there because I said a cashier. But one might walk away and say, oh, there was only one because he said cashier. He did not say cashiers. So you may assume that there was only one person there when in reality we know that there were other people there. Well, of course, these days you never know. But nevertheless, the idea is this is the account that was given from Mark, Luke, Matthew. And so what you discover is that these two men were demon possessed and they were demon possessed by at least 2,000 demons. We know that there was, I mean, uh, possessed by a legion of uh, demons, and we know that there were at least 2,000 pigs that were in a herd and they were feeding, which means that this was a business, a practice in Gentile. You had herdsmen there, and you also know that it was Gentile area because uh, Jewish people had nothing to do with swine. So we know we are in a Gentile area. There are certain things that you can extract from these accounts. Well, these men were living amongst the tomb. They, they were demon possessed and at times they had been chained, chained and burned. And at times they had broken the chains. They were also naked. They were also not in their right mind. They were also violent, so violent that people avoided their path because these men would violently attack them. We also know that at nighttime, late hours of the night, they would be screaming at the mountains, not, not, even, not at even at a person, they're, they're screaming at the mountains, they're yelling and they're loud and they can't sleep. It's certain things that one can easily pick up. I'm gonna share just a few more with you in a moment. But what you start to see is that they are tormented. Yes. Here's what we have to pay close attention to. Demons are real. Yes, they, are. they have an origin and they also have a purpose. They originated from heaven. They were angels in heaven like Satan. Satan called Lucifer in heaven. Satan led a rebellion of one third of the angels against God because Satan wanted to be God. He wanted God's position, God's power, God's authority. He did not want to be accountable to the creator, his creator. Satan was created perfectly. He was a perfect being, just like every person that is created by God is perfectly created, a perfect being. But Satan, as well as all of the angels in heaven, and angels are a supernatural set of beings, they were also given what humans are given, free will, Amen. permissive will. We are given free will to decide if we're going to accept Jesus or not. Once one accepts Jesus Christ, he or she has free will to be obedient or disobedient. You can be a disobedient child of God. 
Adam and Eve, when they were created, they were given free wills. They were not robots. Amen. They were given uh, 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 free reign on the earth to rule and reign. They were just given one thing to stay away from, and that is that tree that sat in the center of the garden. You stay away from that one tree. They made a decision because they were given free will to disobey God. They were not made to do it. They chose to do it. Even when the serpent enticed them to do it, they had free will to say no. They chose to do it. And when they chose to disobey God, consequences came with it. And they were evicted from the garden. Satan and his group of angels that he led against God, rebelled against God, uh, there you can read it in Revelation chapter 12. They rebelled against God, one third of the angels, and they were kicked out, removed, evicted from their post, flung to the earth, one third of the angels. Lucifer lost his grand position. Those angels, they were tossed out too. We now recognize them as fallen angels, all of them are all fallen angels and known as demons. Now here's where you're gonna to have to be careful. Nothing is said in the Bible about them growing ugly. And that's why I want you to lock in. When you look at television and movies and whatnot, you can always recognize the demon because the demon looks scary and everyone starts running. But most of them, listen, there's nothing is said about them getting ugly. In fact, many of us get wrapped up into stuff we have no business being wrapped into and wrapped up into spiritual warfare, fighting. Some of us not fighting the demons. Some of us walking with them because the demon looks attractive. Demons are immaterial spirit beings, but they sometimes present themselves in the form of a human being, and sometimes they possess a human being. Any person that is unsaved is susceptible to not only it being influenced by a demon, but being possessed by a demon. And demons operate in a variety of ways. Some are very subtle, some are not. Some of it rages out like you see these two demon-possessed men. But some got smooth tone. Some, the activities are so, uh, the, the manifestation of their activities is so regular that you can see it. Some, they change their frequency. But an unsaved person is open for demon possession. An unsaved person, I mean a saved person, there is no possibility that a child of God can be demon possessed. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, it is impossible for you to be demon possessed. If one who has claimed to be a Christian is demon possessed, I can tell you that person was never saved in the first place. The Holy Spirit does not share his house with anyone. When the Holy Spirit moves in, no one can put them out either. So, listen, the person that the Holy Spirit has indwelled, he or she cannot even remove the Holy Spirit. A demon cannot remove the Holy Spirit. But an unsaved person is susceptible to demon possession and in being influenced by a demon. Can a saved person be, be influenced by a demon? Yes. Cannot be indwelt? No. But can a demon talk to a, a saved person and influence that person? Absolutely. And the saved person has the opportunity to say no or yes, to obey God or disobey God, because once again, we are given free will. Well, you say, well, how's that person going to know? With the word of God. 
If you don't know and, and, and follow and surrender yourself to the word of God, you can easily be taken away. And when you know the word of God, you can see the enemy's plans and scheme and you will be able to identify when demonic warfare is taking place in your life and you're seeking and they're seeking to influence you. Listen, sometimes when you are getting ready to do something that God has orchestrated a plan for you, Satan can easily, and demonic forces can influence you that this ain't a good thing. You're wasting your time. I, I, I tell you what, ain't nobody gonna help you. You, you, you know what? You just, you look, you look foolish doing this. You're wasting your time, you're wasting your treasure. You know, you just need to give up. Do you know why many people, many Christians don't witness? L listen, don't, don't, if you share the gospel with them at work, they're going to they look at you different. I, I, I don't talk to those people over there because guess what? You too good for them. You, you, you too Christ-like. And so sometimes we're influenced not to even be where God wants us to minister to, minister at, because the devil don't influence us. If you go over there, you're going to get dirty. As opposed to, Lord, would you strengthen me? Would you equip me so I can go and minister, stay clean, and teach them about the one who purifies and whatnot, and go back? But many of us are under demonic influences, and we don't even recognize it. Listen, Satan and the angels, when they were rejected from heaven, now known as fallen angels, known as demons, Satan is the leader of this group of fallen angels. When the angels were kicked out, uh, two things happened. Some were given freedom on earth to be led by Satan to do demonic work. Some were confined. Some of the, them were confined permanently and some of them were confined temporarily. That's why when you go into the book of Revelation, you'll see that some of them will be released during the period of tribulation. Some of them are in the abyss and they will never be released. And some of them have been wreaking havoc even right now. I shared with you last week, they come to church too. So, so angels are real. They origin, we know where they origin, originated from. Uh, they do not procreate. I told you that before, angels do not procreate, they do not get married, they do not have little baby angels that, angels that make baby angels, okay? I told you the cherub in heaven, the cherubim, they're not fat, fat baby angels in heaven with wings, okay? All right, and neither are the seraphim, okay? And, 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 and in heaven, uh, you have this large group of angels, different sex, that sex, S-E-C-T-S, -E sex, okay? That worship God. And you got the ser uh, seraphim and cherubim and others. And Lucifer at one time had, had a high rank and he was amongst the cherubim. Okay. These angels kicked out of heaven, having human interaction with many. These two men, demon possessed. Notice what, what they're doing. No, no, notice here in verse 29 that they're violent. No one could get by. Verse 29, they cried out saying, what business do you have with us, son of God? Now, this is what they yell at Jesus. I love this. Oh, I, lo I love this. What business do you have with us, son of God? So the demons are admitting what man oftentimes refuses to admit. Did you know that this is the first time that a positive affirmation is given about Jesus as the son of God in the book of Matthew? The first time it was implied in Matthew chapter four, but in Matthew chapter eight, 
it is positively affirmed by demons that this is the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 4, it is implied, it's implied when Jesus is taken up, led by the Spirit into the desert, and there he's, he's fasted for 40 days, 40 nights, he becomes hungry, and Satan tempts him, and Satan starts to lay out these challenges to him, and Satan says at least twice, if you are the Son of God. If, trying to sow a seed of doubt, if you are the Son of God. It's the same type of uh, uh, doubt that he seeded in the mind of Abraham and Eve. Did God really tell you that you can have? So he sows doubt, and here he's trying to sow doubt in Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, if you are the Son of God. So three times that's recorded there, and there was many more challenges that are recorded, but every time he has something to say, Jesus counted, listen, you got to be careful with your and my opinions. Jesus counted him, countered him with the word of God. Jesus said, on, listen, on all of these occasions in Matthew chapter 4, it is written. It is written. But in Matthew 4, it is implied if you are the son of God. Here in Matthew chapter 8, the demons, they make a positive affirmation. Oh, what do you have to do with us, son of God? So the demons even recognize that Jesus is the son of God. Now, how would they know this? Because they saw him before. And if you go back and read the gospel and Jesus says in John, I was even there when they got evicted from heaven. Uh, listen, I know some people say, but I thought he was born in Bethlehem. I'm telling you, Jesus said before Adam and Eve even existed, Jesus says, I was there when Lucifer and the angels were evicted from heaven. I was there. And guess what? I was the one that gave the order. They said, what, what do business do you have with the son of God? Now, why would they ask such a question? Notice, they says, have you come here to torment us before the time? Oh, man, I, I love it. Now, listen, what they're telling you is we know the outcome, our outcome. We, we already know that there are some that are permanently confined, and they're permanently confined until they burn up completely in the lake of fire. So they're permanently confined and they're saying, hold up, our time hasn't come, but is this the time? Because they know a time is coming and the issue they have is the same issue many of us in this room want to know. Well, what time is that? They don't know the time, just like you and I don't know the time. They just know that there will be a time. And so now they're asking, hold up, is, is time up? Uh, 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 has time run out? And they're saying, have you come to torment us before? Because they know they're going to be tormented, which is what they do. They seek to make hell in the life of God's creation that was created in the image of God. He works, listen, they work hard to convince a person to never accept Jesus Christ. They're constantly, li listen, God, God's desire is that everyone will be in a relationship with him. But the demons, they work hard to convince people that you don't need Jesus. Girl, girl, girl listen, girl power, man power, man up. You don't need no one. You don't need God. And, and, and don't let it be someone with the wrong motive about money. Because listen, I, I tell you, I, I, I know a lot of people that have money. And I can tell you this, the majority of people I know that have some money are great, great Christians. They are rivers. They're constantly giving, constantly giving, constantly giving. They are not reservoirs. But you get a saved person who has the wrong understanding about money or about uh, 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 academic degrees or, or about a position at a job and they start to 
feel, feel good about themselves. Nobody can, t- listen, that, no one tells me anything. I go where I want to go. I do what I want to do. I'm, I'm a person of authority. And, and that's just where demonic influences want you to think. Because if you think you're in charge, it's hard for you to recognize that you do not have complete control. Let me tell you this. Even when God gives you authority or rule over a particular area of life, whether it's in the workplace, at home, or whatever it may be. Now, God may have placed you there to rule, but one thing I learned is you don't run anything. I've seen it many times. God may put you in charge of a business and whatnot. He said, you are the leader, you're in charge. But guess what? You don't run anything because the reality, God can shut this thing down. Listen, you, that, that little throne you think you're sitting on, he'll take that away, take you away. Listen, take all of it away. You don't run anything. But demonic influences seek to convince you and I, even that we are in control. Therefore, there's no need to accept Jesus Christ. So you have these demons, they cried out, son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? They know that, uh, 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 that doom is in the future for them, or in either, and right now they're concerned is right now. And it says, now there was a herd of many pigs feeding at a distance from them, and the demons begged him saying, if you're going to cast us out, send us into the herd of pigs. So you start to see something a little bit differently here. No, notice, notice this. Okay, so we see demons are real, but here you start to see that Jesus has absolute authority over demons. And so, so you see this laid out in verses 30 through 32. And so remember, they, they use the word entreat. Uh, it's used by the demons. They're requesting to enter the pigs. They're begging, they're pleading, uh, 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 would you please send us into the pigs? Now, they brought it up, right? That tells you something about demons. They're intelligent. They understand what's going on. They can see. They understood who he was. They also understood that he is an eternal God. But they also understand he has, has authority, which is why they say to him, uh, there are some pigs, some swines over there. In fact, it's about 2,000 of them. W- would you send us into them? Oh, man. I, 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 here's, what I, here's what I love about this passage. It just, it, it reveals so much that the, the lack of power and the lack of, of authority that demons have when it comes to Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want you walking away from here saying, yeah, no, demons ain't nothing. I don't have no power. And then you get your behind handed to you. I don't want that to happen to you. Listen, Jesus has authority over them. You don't cross them in your own power, your own might, your own strength. If that, listen, to win spiritual warfare matters, battles, it takes Jesus. It, 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 you and I don't win in our fighting in our own strength and power. You, you're, you're not going to win. Jesus has authority and power. The demons said, hey, you see those pigs over there? Can we go into those pigs and legions are, 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 are uh, loads and lo- tons and tons of, I don't use the word tons, but a great number of demons. And so these two men were greatly demon-possessed, and they had various characteristics. And guys, by the way, if you don't notice, we live in a society and a culture that is heavily under demonic forces. Okay? Demonic forces, spiritual warfare, and it has, I mean, really hurt the mind of society, so much so that a man, he can't even, many men can't even feel at peace with the fact that they were created a male and that they are not a woman. Uh, 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 You have women that um, present themselves and believe themselves to be a man. You you have people that say, I can be either or, whatever I choose to be. And our 
attack and fight and battle is not with them, guys. It's not with them. Demonic spiritual warfare is taking place to hurt and corrupt the mind of man. And I struggle with this kind of stuff. I don't know about you. I, I have friends and family members that struggle with the same thing that many of you all uh, struggle with. And here's another thing. Don't get stuck on that one issue. That's one part of, uh, that, that, that Satan uses. We get so stuck on uh, someone's sexuality when there's so many other battles and fight. And that's what Satan wants you to do. Sometimes you, 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 so, you, you highlighting this one issue and all around you, 10 different things are going on. So don't get, don't get stuck there. And two, whatever you do, don't be one of those Christians that are so good that you don't even know how to love the person and show compassion and mercy because you're so wrapped up in your self-righteousness. And in your mind, you say, I would never do anything like that. You probably wouldn't do that, but you're doing something or you have done something. Don't be looking at me. Grace and mercy abound. What you do, you pray for people and you stay with people. You don't give up on them and don't, listen, if, if this room filled up with a group of people that you say, I don't agree with their standards, I, I, you know, I just can't be at that church. Well, let me let, me let you know something. It's, you think you say, I won't be at that church. The problem is, you might not be a church, part of the church. See, the church is made up of people, not, not a place. If God sent us people that have physical evidence that they're struggling with something, and the church says, well, I don't want to be there because, listen, this, this is right where you need to be. You're right where you need to be. As long as we teach and preach the truth and people's minds and hearts are open, that means that they're hungry, looking, that they know something's not right, and that's why they're listening. And they're fighting. So the last thing you want to do is give up on what God is seeking to do in their life. Uh, I mean, get back on my text. So, these demons, they ask for permission to go into the herd of swine, and Jesus uses the word go. But there's a few things that I just wanted to point out to you that, that will be obvious, at least with these two men, and sometimes you can see. These men were isolated. One of the, one of the outcomes of a person that is experiencing um, either influence from a demonic source, it could be a Christian or, 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 or a non-Christian, but sometimes you see this and a, a person who is demon possessed, of course, has to be unsaved. They're not saved. But a Christian or a person who is not saved, being influenced by Satan, one of the uh, characteristics is that they uh, stay in isolation. Okay? Satan, one of his tactics is to try to isolate you. Separate the sheep from the other group. Separate the baby horse from his mom and dad. Separate, just, just like National Geographic, if I just separate that little baby cub away from the others, there's less protection there. So one of the things you see is that these men are isolated. They're in the tomb, okay? Another thing is that you see that they have an obsession with death. Who in their right mind lives in the graveyard? In in the graveyard. Another sign you can see is, and then you see people now that play around with, a, uh, with the idea of death. There's also the gnashing with the stone, that's the cutting, the, the cutting themselves. That's an issue that many people struggle with. In fact, there may be some here, and I've ministered to countless people uh, that have, uh, have had that particular con concern that needed to be addressed. And oftentimes where they cut themselves are in hidden places, thighs and different things. But these men cut themselves with stones. Uh, they're also naked. In addition to that, they are violent. Also, they have outbursts. They're, they're yelling and howling at the moon and yelling at people. They also have supernatural 
strength, breaking chains and bonds. They have, listen, people, people try to work with them, but they're still breaking free. These are different signs where you can see someone's under the influence. You ever been around someone and no matter what, they just, they just stay mad. And it's not that they, but they always fight, always cursing someone out, always arguing. I, 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 and if you haven't seen stuff like that, I, I, I could tell you some places to go and look where they captured. I don't want to mess up your day uh, on video. And you'll see people having just outbursts when they go to different places. But wherever they go, drama. Drama seems to follow. And I hate the word drama follows because they bring it. My point is, a lot of times what a person is experiencing is influence from demonic forces. Uh, Jesus tells them to go. They ask to go. Jesus uses the word go, demonstrating his authority. Just go. And the demons, uh, they come out of these two men. They go into the swine. But let me just tell you this passage here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him, meaning that he has authority. Watch Philippians chapter chapter 2, verse 10 through 11. It says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Once again, another passage that speaks to the authority and the power that Jesus has. So when Jesus used the word go, it was the, the demons were able to leave the two men and go into this herd of 2,000 swine. Now, watch this part. They go into the swine, Jesus told them that Jesus was the one that told them to go. It proves another thing. One, we already know that a human can be demon possessed. But what you discover is that an animal can too. So the demons went into the swine and, uh, but watch this last part right here. In Matthew 33, 8, verses 33 through 34, it says the herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything. What did they report? They reported this part right here. You got to go back to 32. It says, and they came out, when the demons came out, went into the pig, they came out, went into the swine, and the whole herd, they rushed to the steep, to the cliff, went into the waters. Now, the demons, of course, did not want to be destroyed, right? So they didn't know they were going to go in the water. They just wanted to get out and continue to have influence and wreak havoc. Jesus had them run off into the water, flew off into the water, and pigs, guys, pigs really can't fly. Just like if you ever read Charlotte Webb, the pig didn't make the webs if you didn't just say it. Never mind. Never mind. I'm just saying. Okay, so listen, listen, listen. So the pigs, they ran off the steep bankment into the water and they died. And when that ha- drought, and when that happened, the herdsmen ran away to tell the city. They wanted everyone to know what had happened. And it says, and behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, does it say they worshiped him? How about they said, Jesus, Thank you so much. These two men have been doing nothing but wreaking havoc in our area because these men were famous. Like they were famously known uh, for for being under the influence of Satan. So the people did not come saying, thank you, Lord, have mercy, have for, for healing these men and for the great work that you have done because they have caused nothing but problems. And some of these people had even personally invested their time in these men. How do we know that this? Because... There were times where they were chained and bound. Someone had to chain and bind them. And here they are. They're free now of these demonic forces. And according to Mark and Luke, we know that one, once the demons left these two men, the two men, listen, they had on clothes. They put on some clothes. And they were sitting down in their right mind. Because one of the things is when 
God intervenes in spiritual warfare. Where there was insanity, God brings sanity. When God intervenes in a situation where there's spiritual warfare and God intervenes and win that battle for you, the, 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 the environment that was confusing now has clarity. At one time in an environment where there was, uh, and I don't know about you all, I got a massive, huge family and some, some, some places you go and visit some homes, it's just chaotic all the time. No one gets along. I, 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 I'm telling you like, not just the husband and wife don't get along, the kids don't get along, the dog don't seem to like to be there, the cat upset, everything just upset. The birds don't even fly over the house anymore. They're just sick of it. It's just a chaotic uh, uh, place feel like you just feel with uh, uh, turmoils. Well, when God intervenes, what was confusing, what was, what was just chaos, now there is peace. All, all this peace is in the house. Well, these men are given their right mind. They have their right mind. And the people, you would think, would celebrate that. But instead, when the herdsmen run out and tell the people what happened, that the demons have been evicted from these two men, uh, they were removed. In fact, they went into the pigs. I don't want you to get stuck there. And the pigs, they flew off the cliff. And I, I can just picture people asking, what happened next? So the pigs came back up the bank, I mean, the pigs okay? No, the pigs drowned. Oh man. So they were upset that the pigs drowned because this was a financial matter to them. And Jesus, you messing with my money now. Now, now I, 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 listen, here's the funny thing. Back in the, um, I'm trying to remember this era, but you had the white knights and they would force people to accept Christianity. And of course, you can't force someone to accept Jesus. But they would go out and they would have, ride on their horses and have their long spears and whatnot. But before they go out, guess what they would do oftentimes? They would go in the waters with their horse. They'd ride their horse into the water, the soldier in the horse, but they would keep their sword and their spear above the water because everything they made an allegiance to, to God, but my sword and my spear, I'm gonna use that to swipe people down. Well, guess what? People also still do that today. People will go in the water, be baptized, they'll hold up that one finger and they're holding up their pocketbook and their wallet. Everything goes to God. Well, here, these people were doing that with the pigs. They, they probably would have been okay with these men being cured and whatnot, but you mess with my money. And so now they're upset that their, uh, uh, that their finances have been uh, messed with. So what did, they do? what did they tell Jesus? You need to go. You need to go. Just, just, just move along, go somewhere else. And here's the point. I'm going to close with this. Here's the point. Many of us want victory when it comes to spiritual warfare matters. But what cost? At what cost? Now, I'm not talking about financially. I'm saying at what cost? Because Jesus brought the victory, but people were still upset. The point about it is sometimes it de Jesus was demonstrating, and he still demonstrates in spiritual warfare, that Sometimes what we really want, we want it our way. I, I want spiritual warfare to be won, but if it's going to cost me more time that I got to commit to a person, I don't know. If it's going to cost me my resources, I, I, I don't know. There may be someone that God has placed on your heart to minister to, and you don't want to do it. You know God has the ability and the power to do it. But you're thinking about what role you have to play. To you, you're saying, it's going to cost me too much time. Uh, that means I got to drive over to their house. That means I got to meet them at the coffee shop. Oh, man. Some may be like, I'm called to serve in a particular area. Oh, but that means I got to get to the church 15 minutes early, which means I got to get up 15 to 20 minutes early, which means... And yet and still, we sit back and say, you know what? I don't want... Young people, I do not want families uh, to go 
through life not knowing that there are others that love them, that care for them, that pray for them, that want to invest in them. Many Christians, we want those things, but we're not willing to commit ourselves to actually helping those things get done. And even in this church, just like many churches all across the land, if you're not careful, you can have a hundred people in a church, but five people actually doing all the work for 95 others. And every so often, 95, one of the 95 might stick a hand or stick, stick a finger in, in there. Let me tell you something. You all may say, well, what does it have to do with spiritual warfare? I'm telling you, even when it comes to serving, giving up your time, your talent, your treasure, and your testimony, Satan, one of the things he does, he wants to minimize you and your usage. And when you do that, his objective is, I want to slow down the impact of God's kingdom on this earth. I don't want the, I do not, listen, he does not want the church to be the force that it could be in the world. I'm telling you, if all the churches caught on fire, the governments would have to change. Schools would have to change. Homes would change. I, I, I'm telling you, if the church would just stand up, and give themselves to God's agenda, just like Jesus, then guess what? The world will catch on fire for God. I, I'll tell you this too. You think I won't do anything because if I do anything, I have to do all things. I'm telling you this, if all of us was to stand up together, and no, we ain't, I ain't not asking you to do this, but if we all were to stand up, do you know if we had to lift this piano, all of us together, we all probably would have to lay one finger up under the piece. It's the power of working together. And Satan and demonic forces even want to bring down our acts of service to a low degree because he does not want us to have the impact. And so here's the deal. Spiritual warfare is real. It is real. Demons are real. And when you pray this week, as you pray this week through different things, you pray specifically that demonic influences would not have any way in your home, in your workplace. Ask the Lord to open your mind and your heart to recognize when demonic forces, when, when Satan or a demon is seeking to influence your mind and your heart. And you keep your mind and your heart focused on him. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is you got to be anchored in his word. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we just come before you today just asking that you will open up our minds and our hearts to be able to hear from you, to see your word, to understand your word, but also, Lord, the strength and the wisdom on how to apply your word. We pray right now, Father, that you will be glorified as we seek to be influenced only by the Holy Spirit seek to be led by the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Father, that if there's anyone in this room today that is under the influence of the possession of a demonic force, we pray that they will come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior so that no demon will find rest in them. We pray, Father, for every believer here that is under the influence now of a demonic force. We pray right now, Father, that you would, one, cause that person to have a clear mind and clear heart to recognize, to ask for your help, to ask for your intervention, and to surrender to your will so that that demon will recognize that this is not a place, a space that I have influence over. Father, we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.